So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome again to this room uh, in Harvard Iranian Club. So, we usually have these rooms in Persian. Today, we will have it in mostly in English. Um, I would like to welcome Professor Alavi. Uh, today, we have a special guest. He is one of the prominent researchers in his field in the area of nuclear medicine, molecular imaging, and PET, positron emission tomography. Today, Professor uh, Abbas Alavi is uh, a professor of radiology and neurology and director of research education in the Department of Radiology, as well as associate director for Center, of, Center for the Study of Aging at Bergman School of Medicine uh, at University of Pennsylvania. So he will stay with us a few hours to answer questions related to his life, research, which I'm sure it will be interesting for all of us. Uh, not only he has been a well-known researcher in his field, his students have made a uh, breakthrough in science as well. So he has received uh, several uh, prestigious awards from different uh, societies. And I, I can mention two of them. He is the recipient uh, of many awards and distinctions among which are the highest distinctions in nuclear medicine. So the first one I would like to mention is the George Charles de Hevesi Nuclear Pioneer Award given by the Society of Nuclear Medicine and the Kassam Prize of the Society of Nuclear Medicine as well. So this prize is given to a living scientist whose work has led to a major advance in basic or clinical nuclear medicine. So the Hevesi Award from the Society of Nuclear Medicine was given to him for his pioneering work in the development of PET, positron emission tomography. And it's worth mentioning that in August 1976, he was the first person to perform uh, and involved in the human PET studies of the brain and the whole uh, body. Uh, I will mention the room format and then we can start the room as well. So to allow some time for other uh, people to join the room and the club show up and the room show up in the clubhouse hallway. Uh, the room moderators, Samana, Muhammad, Ehsan, and Navid, they will introduce themselves uh, just uh, briefly. And then we will go to uh, Professor Alavi, so he can introduce himself or any extra point that he want to uh, mention as well. And then we will start the Q&A session. For the audience, there is a link. Uh, if you click on the info account on the stage, there is a bit.ly link, bit.ly forward slash dr underscore alavi, and you can enter your questions in the Slido. If there is already a question by the audience and you would like that uh, to be asked first, please uh, hit the like and it will show up on the top of the list. And if you would like to come to the stage and ask your questions, uh, we will open the stage uh, after an hour and a half. So the duration of the room is two hours. Of course, if uh, Professor Alavi has enough energy and time, he can stay with us and um, answer our questions. At the end, uh, we will go for him for his closing remarks. All right, let's start with the introduction. I can start with myself, I'm Mahmoud Shah. I work at Harvard University as Associate Director for Research Software Engineering in the Department of Research Computing. I'm happy to be in this room today. Uh, well, hello everyone. Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, um, I'm, my name is Samane. I'm an assistant professor at New Jersey Institute of Technology here in the, in the United States since 2019. And prior to that, I did my postdoc at UPenn University of Pennsylvania for three years. So excited to be here and so happy to have our am amazing guest, Professor Alavi. And we are really glad that you accepted the invitation from uh, Harvard Iranian Club. And the focus of my research lab at, at NJIT is developing novel computational methods and multi-scale computational techniques for discovery of groundbreaking question in design and optimization of drug carrying nanomaterials with the hope of uh, their enhanced accessibility to disease cells. Again, uh, welcome, uh, Professor Alavi, and with that, over to you, Mohamed John. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to extend a cheerful welcome to Dr. Alavi as a world-leading professor 
who has outstanding achievement in nuclear radiology. Your presence makes us very, very happy. My name is Mohamed Zari. Uh, I'm a researcher at Harvard Medical School, Department of Medicine, and also John B. Litter Center for Radiation Science and at Harvard Public Health. My expertise is producing new medication and tissues for liver, kidney, and heart disease. I'm done speaking. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself, Esanja. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm Esan Valavi, a PhD student of technology and operations management at Howard Business School, and I'm researching the economics of AI and the evolution of firms and how this AI is changing the AI ecosystem. Uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, Professor Alavi, and I'm also like welcoming him to this. Navijan, please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Navid Zeratkar. I have a PhD in uh, biomedical science from Tehran University of Medical Sciences. I also worked uh, in a startup company in Tehran uh, with Dr. I. Uh, who I believe Dr. Alavi probably uh, knows him. Uh, we built uh, the first preclinical PET scanner in Iran. Then I joined uh, as a postdoc to uh, Dr. Mike King's lab in UMass Medical School. I also had another uh, postdoc uh, with Dr. Simon Cherry at UC Davis. Currently, uh, I work for uh, Siemens in a uh, PET image formation group. Uh, I was also honored of meeting Dr. Alavi in person in UPenn in a session. I'm sure he uh, doesn't uh, remember me, but we are all happy to have him here among us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, for introducing yourself. Um, so we will go to... Professor Alavi, I would like to welcome him again to our club. We usually have these rooms in Farsi, so I, we will leave it to you, uh, any language you want to speak, and uh, welcome again. So I would like, uh, it, it would be great if you could uh, also introduce yourself more in detail, your uh, educational journey. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. It's a pleasure to really talk to my countrymen and women. And really tell you a little bit about really my life story because what I've really had experienced to my life as a whole, right from the childhood up to now, will be of interest and stimulation for young people who are in the audience and want to succeed in this very complex and challenging world. I was born in Tabriz to a family of merchants. My father was a merchant in the bazaar in Tabriz. He dealt with fabric. He used to just stamp some patterns on fabric and, uh, and of course, sell it in the, in the bazaar. Unfortunately, at the age of 30, when I was four and my mother was 24. He developed gangrene of his leg. This was a disease that came from uh, Poland during the World War II and through Russia to our area. And we had no surgeon in the city. We cried for six months along with him, and he died. My mother, of course, was devastated having three children. My sister, who was older than me, and my brother was younger than me, but she was an amazing woman, probably the best mother in the world. And she just decided that she would raise us with whatever means available to her and not to give in, not to give up to the tragedies that she suffered during her really young age. So she takes me to, and I'm six years of age, she takes me to a school in the neighborhood, which had five grades in the same classroom. So I go to the class and I'm sitting in the front row and the teacher started talking to fifth graders. They're just fantastic. They're reading, writing, adding, multiplying. And it comes to fourth graders, a little bit less 
and comes to us and says, copy this Aleph Bey Tese and come to school tomorrow. So I went home and said, Mama, yeah, put me in this class that is filled with geniuses. I could never compete with these guys. I want to become a carpenter. So like the old times, we used to sit on the, on the carpet. So she said, sit down and listen. And I'm listening. She said, Abbas, you go on to the other school. You go on to sit in the classroom, listening to the teacher, doing all he wants you to do. And the other option is to die in that school and we will bury you there. So I go to school the next day, come back and sit on the same carpet. And mama has made a good abgusht and is getting cold. And I'm sitting, leaning down on the floor, doing my homework. And she said, Abbas, come and do your, have a, your lunch. I said, Mama, homework comes first. That was the last time that my mother told me that I had to just go to school and I had no other option. And of course, she really wanted me to become a doctor because she said, we cried for your father for six months. We couldn't do anything. And she suffers so much. I want you to minimize human suffering, however you can. I went, of course, further in my education. I became first in the class. I mean, nobody could compete with me, which was amazing. I had the ability to really compete, but also I had the drive. So really, I got all the awards every three months. So my, I used to bring my uh, records that was on Shaw's, you know, I had a printing of Shaw's picture and given to me by the principal every year. So really, it just was an amazing childhood. You know, we had only 50 cents a day. We did all of our homework in a, under the kerosene lamp. We had a Corsi, you know, Tabriz is a very cold part of Iran. Uh, I did all my homework under this kerosene lamp and just very primitive life with 50 cents a day. So I was, of course, first in mathematics in Iran. When I was in the 11th grade in 1956, there was a national a competition among students. I was first in math. So really, I had great interest in science in general, but mathematical, physical sciences in particular. So I went to my teachers and I asked them, I mean, just as you know, a very, very good student and I really like to solve problems. Is medicine going to be like that? They said, of course, you take exams in math, physics, chemistry before you go to med school. So I go to med school, of course, a very stiff competition in Iran, as you all know. So I was able to go to medical school. And honestly, it was a zoo for me. I said, Abbas, I could have gone to MIT if I had gone to Danish Kadev and and just got my education in something that really was more logical. But unfortunately, those days, it was very difficult. If you left the medical school, you couldn't enter anymore to any educational system. So I really had no choice to bite the bullet and continue medical school, hoping that there'll be a day that I'll go back to physics and mathematics and chemistry. So there's, of course, a lot of people were coming to America. It was much easier to come to America those days. So I came to Philadelphia, unfortunately, being again a Persian, being a Muslim, there was a lot of discrimination. And so we really couldn't go to the University of Pennsylvania right away or Harvard or any of the major schools. So I went to a community hospital in Philadelphia. And the first thing that caught my eyes was use of radioactive agents in medicine. I said, this is exactly what I came to medicine to do. So I had, of course, in a few, couple of years of training in internal medicine, not that I didn't have memory, I could memorize things, I could definitely do everything that everybody else was doing, but I love to solve problems. And so eventually through the VA hospital, I got introduced to a colleague in oncology who 
you know, he was from the University of Pennsylvania. And he said, Abbas, you are just as smart as any of our residents and fellows. Do you want to come to Penn? So this city was the beginning of my early introduction to academic life in America. This was 1969. Then I decided that this was a time. I just want to use the name of Penn to be able to move up in the scale because just going to a community hospital, nobody will recognize your accomplishments or intelligence or drive. So I said to myself, no, nah, this is the time to move into a field that I will really enjoy and contribute to it. So I applied to radiology to Harvard. I got to into Deaconess the Brigham program. And then I really came back to Philadelphia as a fellow in nuclear medicine. Honestly, I just couldn't also continue doing a lot of radiologic studies, which are not really scientific. We just also pattern recognition. And I didn't want that. I really wanted to start everything from the basement and move up to the attic. So I came and worked with David Kuhl, who almost got the Nobel Prize. And he, I became his right-hand man. He was the first to introduce tomography before Hansfeld introduced X-ray CT. So I was really doing state of the art. This is 1971, just imaging techniques that was purely based on science, physics, mathematics. And of course, things were starting in the move of also looking at molecules. So that really completely changed my life. So this is really now 50th anniversary of my involvement with radioactive agents and molecular imaging. And I became David's right-hand person. And we were doing things that no one else could do. And among them is really introducing this molecule called FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, which has become as important as introduction of CT or MRI or any other optical technique. Really, this has revolutionized the field of molecular imaging, has made positron emission tomography. Of course, positrons are, you know, the type of just electrons that come up of uh, decay of uh, the active positron emitters and then gives two gamma rays that we can take them and reconstruct as images, as tomographic images. So this city was an amazing turn in my career. I really was in heaven knowing that finally I'm in my high school classes, which I love, you know, doing geometry, doing algebra, you know, just all sorts of sciences getting introduced to chemistry. And I think that really has led me into it becoming a pioneer, which I never ever dreamed of, you know, come to America, be called as a pioneer, but it just shows that. Yeah, the persistence, just having an aim, not looking right, not looking left, just charging ahead. So Ilya really, have become one of the most cited people in medicine. Uh, I, in fact, at the University of Pennsylvania for years, I was the most cited, most published faculty at Penn. So yeah, that's just my edge index is unmatched in the university. So Ili clearly just shows that Ili hard work, determination, and not giving in, not giving up. Don't let those people who discriminate against you get you. Just tell them, I will show you. So Ili, this has been an amazing journey. And I am, of course, most grateful to my mother, just making me sit down and listen to her that I have no option but working hard and just doing all I could to, to succeed. And one of the highlights of my uh, life, as Mahmoud mentioned, was getting my, this De Hevesi Award, which is a award named after the Nobel laureate De Hevesi. He was the one to either use, he was a physicist, looked at radioactivity, used radioactivity in, in animals, and I got that in 2004, and fortunately, 
it happened in Philadelphia. And I really had, I brought my mother to Philadelphia. And, and of course, my family all moved in here, my sister and their family. So my mother was sitting in the audience and on a wheelchair because she had knee surgery. And one of my colleagues introduced me and what I had accomplished. And I got the award and walked on and mama stands up, walks towards me, limping because of her knee problem and raises her arms, puts her on my neck and says, Abbas, thank you for not disappointing me. You know, this city, it was just highlight of my life that having a just fantastic mother and guiding you, leading you, and you work along with her and succeed in life. So really, this is, I have gotten all the awards, I've been recognized all around the world, and, and it's just, it's a dream. I just cannot believe that, you know, this is me. But, you know, clearly hard work is really the centerpiece of success in life. And I will encourage every one of you, you inherited whatever you have in your brain from your parents, you cannot change that, but it can change the way that you're going to use that brain. And hard work is number one. And not really giving up. Just let people discriminate against you. Just show them that if they throw you out of this door, you go on and come back from that window. So this is really my advice to people who are in Iran, people who are in Europe, people who are in America. And, and just don't underestimate yourself and know your strength and weakness and do all you can in life to really just get where you belong and just be happy with what you do. Just get up every morning and say, I'm happy, I'm going to work. Work hard, just work 10, 12 hours a day. Weekends are good days to get a lot done. So really, this is really what is going to make you compete in this very difficult world that everybody wants to kick you, everyone wants to put you aside and get all you have. So that is really my advice to the young people who are in the formative years of their lives. And, you know, just never just give up. So that's my brief discussion. <laughs> of course, it was a little long, but that's really my life story, which I'm hoping that will be of just of value and help to young people who think that they are disadvantaged. Just if I succeeded, you go to succeed. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, whenever you mention your mom, it's really heartwarming uh, how she was an inspiration for you and help you to be who you are now. Also, regarding your childhood, it was, a, it was interesting, although a bit hard, given you lost your father early. But you have gone through all those hardships and made you uh, ready for who you are today as a hardworking scientist. I also heard some delicious and warm words as Alpush and Corsi. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned your research, and but because our audience are coming from a diverse background, I would like to also, uh, if it's possible, to explain your research in a more simpler language to help with the flow of discussion in the room. Uh, and then uh, we can start with other moderators question. All right. You know, the difference between what I do and what other imaging specialists do is really very easy to explain. CT and MRI are well known to almost everybody around the world these days but they look at structure. So very much like you have a high rise, you look at it, you have a high rise building, you look at it and see in the structure. So this is really what it does. So looks at the brain, see the brain where it is, the fluids around the brain, in the skull, which is the bone around the brain, but it cannot tell you how that brain is working. So looking at the high rise, you see this beautiful, beautiful building, everything looks shiny. You go in and turn on the light, it doesn't come out. Turn on the air conditioner, it doesn't go out. You go to the toilet, it doesn't flush. So we look at that function. 
the function of organs in the body. And honestly, function is as important or as anything we do in medicine. This is what we do. We're just looking at how brain works, how heart works, how lung works. So unfortunately, people like structure. So everybody was very excited when CT and MRI were introduced. How can you hide anything from these beautiful images? And I will say 90% of what you're looking for is looking at how organs, disease is function, how active they are. So if I just have a dead person's head in the CT machine, an image with CT or MRI, you show to the best neuroradiologists, these are the specialists in the brain imaging, they cannot tell the difference between the dead brain and a live brain. But I could not get a molecule of FTG, deoxyglucose that I mentioned, into the brain of that person. So there'll be nothing there. So really, function is, as I said, 90 and maybe even more than that. Uh, are there normal function in the brain? How my brain is working? How really active it is? And definitely in disease. This is really what I've done since 76. I've been going around the world educating people about the importance of molecular imaging, functional imaging, looking at function. Alone, just not alone, of course, these days we have PET CT. We have got PET MRI. And these actually have gotten Nobel Prizes. So, really, it's just important to realize that there's more to imaging than looking at the structure alone. We got to do molecular imaging. My FTG was fantastic. Made PET to survive. Positron and Shunta Markley survive. Without my FTG, this discipline would have never gone this far. But we have 3,000 different compounds that have been introduced to the literature. So we can look at a lot of other activities. And the FDG only looks at the glucose metabolism, but that's not the only thing that we have in our body. We can look at receptors in our brain to see how a person develops Parkinson's disease. We can look at calcification in the, in the arteries, which is the mother of atherosclerosis. This is just changing the world. We can diagnose atherosclerosis in somebody who's 15 years of age in America because they have such a bad diet, eating all the hamburgers, cheeseburgers, while CT scan, MRI scan will be negative on those people. So we got to diagnose disease in the in earliest stages. So that is the disease stage that will be treatable. When I have developed heart attack at the age of 50, there is nothing you can do. And that is the structural changes that have come very far and therefore occluded the vessel and therefore cause heart attack, strokes. So we can diagnose the disease in the molecular level, which is the earliest phase of the disease and treat that at molecular level. So this is the greatest thing right now in medical imaging as I said, especially the combination of CT and PET, combination of MRI and PET, gives you the best information. You have a structure from CT and MRI. You have got molecular functional information from PET. We are developing drugs. Merck, in a, a neighborhood company in the Philadelphia area, has 10 PET machines in animals, making all the drugs labeled with these positron emitters like chlorine 18, carbon 11, and others that are labeled to the drugs, see where they go. This is the future of imaging. This is the future of drug development and, and so forth and so on. So this is really the greatest revolution in medicine. There's no question about the importance of PET as the greatest modality in medicine and it's just you know, it's revolutionizing Everything, we have animal facilities at places like Harvard, Penn, you know, Hopkins, that we do work in the basic science level, you know, working with our colleagues, PhDs in the medical school and other basic science facilities, and then eventually move that to human being first as research and eventually as clinical applications, which is really what you know, just halting is all about. Just, just a few days ago, we got approval of FTG, even though I did a lot of research myself in this area, looking at inflammation infection. 
the two most common diseases of mankind. And PET is going to be the way to go to diagnose infection, inflammation, tuberculosis all over the place. And we can either decide what drug is working, what drug is not working by PET and inflammation. If you turn on your television in America, you're hearing all about rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis. These are inflammatory disorders that we can use PET to see the drug is working or is not working. So it's been an incredible technology. And for me, as a physician scientist, this was God's gift to me. I just couldn't have imagined that one day I will be in my high school classes in Dabiristan, Sadi, in Tabriz, but doing PET in physics, mathematics. And it's just been an incredible just change in my path that really has just brought me enough, you know, to science again. And, and also, I want to just for younger people who have got PhDs in chemistry, physics, think about really moving to PET as a, as a PET career, because this is really right now needed. We need a lot of intelligent people, people who are creative. We can come up with ideas in our field, and there's not going to be an end to it. You know, just every major institution should have PET. I've tried to do this in Iran. You know, it's just not been easy. I tried to work with the Minister of Health. And, you know, right now, like Turkey has you know, 150 PET centers. Unfortunately, we don't have very many. We have got only two, three in, uh, in Iran. There's one in Mashhad, one in Tehran, and I think one is Shiraz. But, you know, that's what I try to do. Unfortunately, because of the restrictions of movement, I've not been able to really go and help my colleagues. I've connected them to people in Denmark, and I'm just hoping that we will get this technology to people in Iran because they deserve it as any other country in the world. It just, uh, it, it, it's a somewhat complex. You require a lot of PhD chemists, PhD physicists, you know, quant just computer scientists and quantitative people. You know, these are very important parts of uh, PET. And, but it really, and also requires scientifically oriented physicians who really understand the science of uh, the, you know, PET. And so this is in a, in a brief, it's not, of course, a brief, but uh, in, in the capsule, what Ili Pet has done and is about. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your detailed explanation. Um, these techniques are being used all around the world, as you mentioned. I cannot emphasize more on your contribution um, in these fields and the impact your discoveries have had on people's life. And thank you for sharing the good news for using PET for inflammation diseases. Um, as you said, I hope also we can increase the pet centers back home. And as you, I just echo uh, your words that they also deserve deserve it as other countries in the world. Okay, um, we'll go to uh, Samana for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I also would like to thank you uh, for uh, I mean, sharing your life journey and educational journey with us and how to reach to this current and amazing position. Um, and also how uh, this uh, use of uh, FDG PET along with other structural uh, um, uh, imaging such as CT can have substantial impact in managing serious diseases and disorders. So you uh, mentioned about how your family, especially your mother, influenced you in your form formative years. And you also would like to hear about uh, any professional role model, because you are definitely a great mentor and you uh, trained a lot of trainings uh, for decades. Uh, so we would like to hear if there is any professional role model for you who has, uh, who has your mentor, who had substantial influence in you, please. Well, definitely, you know, my uh, mentors in elementary school and high school in Tabriz were fantastic. If anybody thinks that Iran is a land of a uh, bunch of, you know, nothing, you know, merchants going to bazaar and, uh, and not knowing anything about science, they are wrong. I mean, they were just fantastic. They introduced me to, and I you know, just don't want to mention if one particular person because every one of them was just great. I'm just looking back 
and see the education that I got in Tabriz was just fantastic. Medical school, of course, you know, our medicine was patterned after French medicine, which really bothered me immensely. It was really totally unscientific. So even though we had some great teachers in, in, in a medical school, but they were all in a pattern after uh, French medicine, which was corrupt, being honest with you. I just didn't have French in the science or pseudoscience in medicine was very, very misleading to the community because it, after Reza Shah came to power in Iran, he patterned Iranian medicine after French medicine. He actually every year was sending hundreds, 150 students to France to learn medicine, of course, some other sciences as well. The University of Tehran was strengthened. So I really didn't like the you know, medicine in Iran. And therefore, I don't have good memories of any of the teachers because they were just memorizing and regurgitating what was in French books. Of course, things were changing in the 50s, you know, uh, after the 1953 coup d'etat, its relation between Iran and America strengthened, and a lot of people went to America, came back. So medicine changed in Iran. So I'm sure that a lot of good teachers are not currently, especially like Shiraz. Shiraz was affiliated with the University of Pennsylvania. So a lot of good people used to go there from Penn and teach there. But you know, in America, my main early person who really strengthened my desire to get where I am now was David Cool. Of course, he was my mentor for uh, six years. He left in 76, and that's how I became chief of nuclear medicine, which was amazing at the University of Pennsylvania with my background being nothing compared to Penn graduates, Harvard graduates, Hopkins graduates. So, but David really built a very strong base for my future career. He was just such a great mentor and he just really was very encouraging. I was just amazed to see someone who is really such a genius to really support someone from nowhere, from Iran, with very poor background and just lead me the way, the way that he did. And and of course, after that, I just, you know, I've looked at the world scene, both in America, elsewhere, people have inspired me. And these are very, very important aspects of uh, really moving up in the scale and becoming more innovative. And uh, and I said, these are just, you know, little things that have fallen in place and have led me to the path that I am in. And I'm 83 right now. And I work as hard as anybody in their 20s and 30s. So that inspiration that I have gotten from so many people that I've dealt with, both in America and, of course, dealing with a lot of people around the world, gives me a lot of vigor. Really, I just get up every morning and I say, what am I going to do today that will be different from yesterday? So this is really what you have to do in your abilities, in your environment. And and that's really, you know, just my description of how people have inspired me. And, and I just don't listen to people who are negative. Don't listen to people who are nihilist, as we say in America. It just listen to people who really just are just smiling and const- never giving in to the just failures and difficulties and look at positive sides of things. And that's what I've learned from some great people that I've dealt with. Yeah, awesome. Amazing. Thank you for sharing uh, that. Uh, Mama John, over to you. Professor Alavi, as you know, Tronstick has been used for strategies that combine non-invasive imaging based diagnosis with therapy. Nowadays, why do you use this technique, especially for prostate cancer and neuroendocrine tumor? I would appreciate if you share your thought about this technique, its challenges, and future prospects. Well, I didn't, uh, it, it, it just shows that imaging doesn't have to be only dealing with diagnosis. Imaging has to 
lead to doing something more than that because eventually we have to, you know, modify the disease activity. So this is also the power of the use of radioactive agents in medicine. And that is not only use it for diagnostic purpose, but also uses for treatment purpose. So there's this field is called teranostics. You know, I uh, uh, just uh, I edited a journal called Pet Clinics, and one of the issues is on teranostics, and which is really just going to come out very soon. So we exactly describe not only prostate and endocrine, but other diseases. You know, there are now applications in cancer, other cancers that we can use radioactive uh, elements you know, like with monoclonal antibodies. We definitely can use radioactive agents to both diagnose and treat thyroid cancer. So this is a probably the, the most exciting thing right now in our field. And unfortunately, Europeans are ahead of us and Germans in particular have been fantastic. And fair number of the scientists in Germany who are doing this type of work are also Persians, which is really a lot of people actually, you know, in, they couldn't come to America, they've come to Germany. So there are some yeah, there are Persians who are really into this, much easier to regulatory-wise to treat people with their active material in Germany than, than in America. Our Food and Drug Administration is very, very strict about treatment. So American uh, contribution is not as significant as your particularly Germans. So it's a very well, and a very exciting stuff and combines what we do with imaging, you know, like as you mentioned, you know, like prostate cancer, we can image with the diagnostic isotope, presence of cancer, and then go with treatment aspects of, uh, this is called PSMA, and and that really you know is revolutionary because after lung cancer, prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in in a humans, and and I did you know the fact that we find every cell in the body and treat it because radiation therapy just only goes to bulk lesions. You know, there's a lesion in the bone that is five centimeters. Radiation therapy just focuses on that very large lesion. But the cancer could be in the lymph nodes. It could be somewhere else that we cannot even visualize. Why definitely CT or MRI, but they are there. And having these you know, chasers, molecules that chases disease wherever they are and, and just get rid of them is the way to go. So systemic treatment is going to be the way to go. And our techniques, these teranostic techniques, are going to be the way to go, to really just use the diagnostic agents with PET to see where the disease is and then move to therapy agents and and just get rid of them wherever they are. So really, this is exactly, really, my blessed mother told me, just minimize human suffering. <laughs> you know, she said, we suffered a lot and I want you to really do something that those people suffer less. I mean, right now, that 10 million people are getting FDG scam. But my expectation is that within the next five, 10 years, there will be 100 million people. CT alone is not going to survive as diagnostic test. MRI alone is not going to survive as diagnostic test. It's going to be PET CT and followed by treatment that are doable with PET. So this is really. Not everything is going to be possible, but there'll be a lot of ways to really attack cancer cells molecular, cellular-wise, not go with bulk disease as radiation therapist does. And of course, you know, chemotherapy, they really, you know, unfortunately, it's not that easy to cure or even treat many patients with chemotherapy. It's very systemically very toxic. You know, people get sick, people die from chemotherapy complications other than cancer. 
So we are adding a major dimension to use of radioactive elements by having this therapy that is really just very powerful and very unique and fills in the gaps that exist with conventional treatments for cancer. But as I said, it's not only cancer, we can look at the inflammation. You know, just it's just fantastic to really use antibodies, like we're doing with psoriasis, we're doing with rheumatoid arthritis, and, and use PET to really guard these therapies. And so really in every level, we are making a major dent on disease activity that has resisted us. I mean, just medicine is rapidly moving into science. So we are attracting a lot of PhDs who never considered that medicine will be a domain. They just want to be isolated in the universities, in their own laboratories, and, and never come close to the hospital and deal with, you know, work with colleagues in, in, the, in medicine. But that really is changing because of what PET has done. Hello? Yeah, fantastic. Well, you know, I think Mohamed uh, is uh, satisfied with the answer. So it's probably best if I like, can start asking questions, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to piggyback on what you said to Mohamed about uh, Germans and mostly Europeans being ahead in developing technologies, and especially in this research area. Uh, can you, like, you know, develop more that idea and also like, tell us if it was you who was... Uh, deciding on uh, uh, on immigration like you know, policies or maybe even research policies, what would you have done differently from the administration to bring this research, this line of research back to the country? Well, I mean, you're talking about American research or you're talking about yeah, or uh, Yes, Iran? like, uh, you, no, 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 uh, like the American type of research. Well, I think, you know, we have our rules and regulations. I all get too crazy. You know, the Food and Drug Administration has been terrible to our field. You know, we just, you know, it's just you have to use a lot of money to be able to, you know, show to the Food and Drug Administration that it is something is not toxic and human body can tolerate. So unfortunately, being, let me just tell you the situation for like Food and Drug Administration with academic institutions versus, of course, big industries. You probably all are following some, you know, craziness that is going on with Alzheimer's disease and looking at amyloid. This, of course, you know, amyloid, you know, is the little plaques that start to develop in normal brain as well as in patients with Alzheimer's disease. This is, of course, dementia. That is unfortunately very common. We have 6 million people with Alzheimer's disease in America, but we have a lot of people who have got early disease that you cannot even diagnose as being Alzheimer's disease. So the, if a scientist wants to do something related to Alzheimer's disease, we have to go through a lot of really complicated path. But having it in big industries getting involved and and it you know, led to big movement in treating patients with Alzheimer's disease with anti amyloid tough drugs. And of course we had to use imaging to see whether there's plaques in the brain and and then give these uh, antibodies. And this really led to it is just spending like five billion dollars. And of course, I was against it, both amyloid imaging as well as treatment and antibodies. But having these big companies, G and others, just being behind these things because they saw this huge benefit from developing these treatments with antibodies, treating Alzheimer's disease, that they invested heavily and they got through the FDA. FDA approved the treatment for treatment of these, this agent, this uh, Alzheimer's disease. 
And, and I, of course, I was against it. If we just go to literature, put my name, and put Alzheimer's disease, and what is in the media, you'll see a lot of editorials and everything. And it just, you know, what bothers me is that, unfortunately, ultra-capitalism, which is a big problem in America, is just infiltrated our society, and everything that is in the hands of big companies gets approved, gets done. But when it comes to scientists, at Penn, at Harvard, at Hopkins, at UCSF. We just don't have the power to deal with the FDA. So a lot of good ideas never go all the way because like for our field, we use tracers. We're just sending a spy to the body to show plaques in the brain, to show calcification in the arteries, show you know, PSMA concentration in prostate cancer. But we have to do the same thing that drug companies do for toxic agents, which should not be the case. Germans don't have that. Germans can go to their in a province and get everything through, which is what they have done. That's why they have been fantastic in getting much more done, especially for treatment purposes in Germany than we have been able to do in America, because just we don't have the money. You need a lot of grants. You need a lot of support from the institutions and our specialty is relatively small up until now. It's rapidly changing. It's going to be the big specialty in, in imaging, but we just didn't have the support in department of radiology. Honestly, I did everything on my own. I have millions and millions of dollars just bring on my own from the NIH to be able to do what I've done. But department of radiology, which supported the MRI, which supported the CT, paid from our patient care income to do research in those areas. So unfortunately, this is a very scientifically oriented specialty. My specialty, radiologists didn't understand the implications of it. Now they do. I mean, all the radiology chairman realized that the future is going to be molecular imaging bit bad, but they do not So these have really contributed to lack of progress or not as fast moving aspect to what we do with our specialties. And Germans have done that, you know, Northern Europeans, the Netherlands and Denmark, these are also, you know, doing a great job. But Germans have been the king, you know, there's the, and so they really have done uh, a lot more than we have been able to do in America. Of course, Japanese are, you know, been good and Koreans are good. China is now becoming number one in our specialty. You know, they, they are now second in publications to Americans and Europeans. They're just coming up. And they don't have, again, very strong rules about what you do in medicine. So China is really going to be big. And I'm also hoping that with good relation that Iran has with China, some of you know, Chinese science will go to Iran because right now you know, Iran is really disconnected from Europe and uh, America for sure. So Chinese are getting into the science in a big way. They're just charging ahead. You know, there's a new imaging technique called total body PET that you can look at the entire body in two minutes to look at every disease possible. And guess what? Chinese are the now marketing the total body PET. There's a company in Shanghai. United Image, and I'm a consultant to them, and I'm dealing actually with eight to ten machines that they have put in, in China. So this is really going to be a big thing in imaging. You know, just look at diseases, especially diffuse in nature, like blood cancers, like atherosclerosis, like you know, musculoskeletal uh, diseases, such as osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. These are going to be best assessed by total body PET. You know, just you look at the entire body for this assessment. You know, you just couldn't do this with CD or MRI. So, and of course, conventional PET, you know, only looks at 20, 30 centimeters of field of view at one time. So they're not practical. So you can see that technology is really rapidly moving in every direction, both imaging-wise, instrumentation-wise, as well as new tracers for diagnosis, as well as new tracers for treatment. And China is really, is going to be ahead of us. I mean, every level, both economy, you know, they're now becoming 
really the weapons and that they just I saw now the second atomic bomb production. So they really are just putting 1.4 billion people, highly motivated, hardworking people, and they're leading them in the right direction, you know, in contrast to what they were doing with communist regime. Now they're just encouraging everybody to really get into science and research. And, and as I said, I'm hoping that Persians will benefit from some interaction with China. Unfortunately, language is a big problem, but Chinese are now you know, becoming very fluent in English and, uh, and they're just going to be able to communicate by English with the Iranians. Excellent. So <clears throat> if I have, like, I do have a follow-up question on that. Um, if you don't mind answering this one, because uh, I realize that's not exactly your field, but uh, it's extremely beneficial for me to understand like uh, the dynamics of the business in this area. Uh, what you mentioned as FDA's power and big money that, that is behind like big corporations, uh, to me it looks uh, looks like there are two barriers. One is the political barrier and the other one is like the logistic barriers, like probably doing tests and these tests are costly and then you have to do, you have to like, you know, spare a lot of money uh, on the business. So which side is more effective in seeing this uh, the, the, like the current situation. Uh, do Germans have only political barrier removed, or do they have it also with the with the logistic barriers? Like you know, they found um, startups, or they found uh, the, uh, the any initiative better than the U.S. Well, I know honestly, Germans are extraordinary people. I mean, that's why they have been so proud of themselves. They definitely allow good minds to really reach their, their aim. Honestly, if you want to come to the University of Pennsylvania, you got to have $80,000 a year. That means that if you go to college or medical school, you will end up with more than half a million dollar debt. Somebody who doesn't have money is not or doesn't have credit to borrow money will not be able to come to the University of Pennsylvania. A lot of talents are wasted in America because education has become a big business. We all are competing, Penn, Harvard, Yale, all competing to have big pile of money in the university. So education is human right, and that is missing. Ultra capitalism that we have, which is terrible when it comes to uh, the drug companies, when it comes to weapons makers, you know all these, you know, things that deal with, you know, just subs, just the day to day aspects of life, is now applicable to education. So I always tell people. My education in Iran was $28.50 cost to me, to my family. And those were for the stamps that they put on my carname. You know, that's all, you know, I paid for my education. I could have never gone even to the worst colleges in America because we couldn't have afforded it. We, just, we had 50 cents a day to, to barely pay for our food. So even a country like Iran is significantly better than America for really encouraging education. And your Europeans have got free education. You know, I go to Denmark, I collaborate with them. You can just, you know, go any way you want without spending a penny for all the education that you want in Denmark. It's just fantastic. We got to mix ultra capitalism. Yes, there has to be capitalism. Communism couldn't survive because there was no incentive to work hard, to go to medical school, to go to engineering school, because a laborer got the same amount of money as a doctor. I used to go to China in the 80s. You know, I just, I talked to doctors, they were all making $100, and so did somebody who was taking the elevator up and down. So there was no reason for a, a guy who was running the elevator to go to higher education. So we have to have some incentive in a society, but 
not to the extent that we have in the United States. This is not sustainable. The reason that we have had all the wars, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Vietnam, is all because of weapons makers. They just went to the president, went to the Congress, Republican Party, create this war. Why did we attack uh, 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 yeah, Iraq? Because they just wanted to sell a lot of weapons to the organization. Also, they thought that they can get the oil from Iraq. And, and that was an incentive for you know, Bush to go to Iraq and created the mess. Of course, it's been good for Iran to get rid of Saddam Hussein, but it was just, just horrible for the people of Iraq. They're done. You know, 20, 30 million people are just suffering every day. So really, our really ultra-capitalism country being run by the big companies, as they did, of course, during the Trump administration, are just horrible aspects of our society. And healthcare, education are human rights. And unfortunately, that is not applicable to Americans. Europe, especially the Northern Europeans, is just the best system in the world are Danish, Finns, Swedish, and Norwegian's regime. They tax people. You, you know, if you, you know, are uh, making $200,000 a year, you pay 70% tax. And you, know, you don't pay as much tax if you're a teacher in Philadelphia. But in America, Trump make, made only 1%, paid only 1% tax. So there are all these loopholes that allow people to keep more money at the expense of their stuff society. So really, inequality in education, healthcare in America is the biggest problem that Europeans have gotten around, especially as I said, the mixture of socialism and capitalism, which is really what they have in Northern Europe, particularly the Denmark and the Scandinavian countries as a whole, is going to be the way to go. This is what eventually is going to happen in America. There's going to be an uprising if we don't address these. You know, these blacks and Spanish and other minorities who cannot make it all the way to the top in our country eventually they're going to rise up. I mean, there's just unavoidable that a very special segment of the society is benefiting from this ultra-capitalism, especially people who are not as able, who are not gifted, who are not really privileged to have really a good life, are being sidelined in our society. And, and that is really just something that I, you know, worry about because having myself been through some difficult parts of my life and seeing the difficulties that you face if you are not privileged, you are not born to the celebrity, you are not born to the rich people, you know, which really is the majority of the people and that's what's happening in America. Well, thanks for the answers. Uh, John, I'm coming back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I just want to echo what uh, Abbot said about healthcare and education. Uh, both are human rights, and I totally agree with you. Um, so before uh, going to one of our audience, Shiva, I would like to ask uh, one of the audience question on the Slido. So I will read the question as they, they wrote. Uh, so uh, Mr. Jafari asks you, how did you maintain your passion for science? They there have been definitely been failures. Uh, how did you keep trying again after each failure? You know, it just uh, it is just amazing how I enjoyed solving problems. That was really even when, like, in fourth grade, when I was just introduced to trigon, pentagon, and seeing how we can calculate the area. That was so exciting to me that, you know, with these things that, you know, I was just always so excited solving the problem that the mathematician in 1700 had solved it. You know, I would just come to home from, uh, you know, our school and eat dinner and then sit down and do my homework. And they, my pleasure really was, especially science-based subjects, and mathematics and geometry were just great to me. I just will sit around the course, and of course, during most of my school years, we had course because it was so cold. And and just solving these problems, being able to sit down 
and say, oh, I've solved the problem. I'm going to school tomorrow with an answer. That really excited me about it is not just reading and memorizing like we were doing it with the Quran or geography, history. Those were facts. They weren't changing. But science was changing and science was based on logic. I love logic. I don't want just to do anything that a, a mullah goes to the, in the podium and, and says to the people, you know, whatever happened uh, during Muhammad's time, during Hussein's time, it really, that was just not exciting to me. And, I, you know, I enjoy history. I enjoy, you know, things that were interesting from just historical point of view or just important knowledge. But anyway, what I want, as I said, to do even today is to do something different every day. And science provides that. This is really what excited me, to just... Find a way to detect somebody's infection, somebody's cancer, somebody's Alzheimer's disease based on what I have. You know, I just, you know, when I walk with my wife and she's talking to me a mile a minute and I'm solving a problem that I want to deal with. And she says, what did I tell you? I said, repeat it again. Because I was just listening to her. I was just trying to do something. You know, this is just walking along the, you know, stream or climbing up the mountain, I'm just trying to do something that relates to really something, doing something different every day. So that's what did it, my personality. And, and, and that's why, you know, I've been able to solve a lot of problems when I was in high school and when I'm now as a scientist, you know, to just realize what is the world suffering from and try to make a dent in minimizing those suffering, but the tools are available to you. And fortunately, as I said, our field has been fantastic. You know, just in you know, Huntsville built a CT machine in his garage. We had, he had one idea and he did it, but not very many people have that type of idea to be able to be an engineer, to really just come up with the idea. But yeah, they feel like my field, molecular imaging, there's a lot that is sitting in literature. There's a lot that's ongoing in your own universities that you can delve into and come up with some application. You know, translation is considered most important in, in everything. Just pure science has no meaning. It's just going to sit there and get dust in the literature. But translation is the most rewarding thing. Namely, you do something that you can translate to day-to-day -day life. And that could be it is making a car or having a hybrid machine that or it is in medicine, you know, just something that is really in a sitting in basic science lab and taking it all the way to day to day practice of medicine is so rewarding. You know, that's really why, you know, just you just cannot do science only for the sake of science. That is really doesn't have as much excitement, as much impact on the society. If we are paid to do our work, if the government spends money on research, you got to take it all the way to those who pay taxes to get those grants from the NIH, from NSF. So really, that's my view, that you have to do research that has translation aspect to it. Just don't do it just only for just pure scientific point of view. You know, that's what people did in the paper and pencil and just sit in the, their, you know, booklets and uh, never went anywhere. Great. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, we have few audience on the stage. Uh, so we have had this room for over an hour. So I appreciate if the audience ask one question and if you have more questions or follow up, please stay on the stage and we will come back to you if the uh, room time allows. Uh, and also, if you are in the room and for any reason you would like to just ask your question without coming to a stage, please use the link on the info account. Uh, there is a, a Slido uh, link, bit.ly forward slash dr underscore alavi. And then uh, you can write in either English or Persian, and we will ask uh, Professor Alavi uh, during the Q&A. Thank you. Um
So let's go to Shiva. Uh, welcome to the stage. Uh, we'll hear your question. Hi, everyone. This is Shiva. I'm an assistant professor in UC Santa Cruz working in imaging instrumentation. It's truly a pleasure to talk and listen to uh, Abbas John. I have two questions. I ask the second one because it's just like I have no clue and I'm really confused. So um, my question is that how come that we don't utilize functional imaging in psychology? It's just like to me is a pattern aspect. There are such amazing modalities for like functional brain and then just... Uh, I wonder why, like in no other area, you go to doctor and then just tell them about yourself and then they don't prescribe you medicine that they are going to totally, you know, like mm, kind of make you crazy or something. But then how come when you go to a psychologist, you just talk to them and then they never ask you to do like a, a spect or something that it just tells more to them about the function of your image. What do you think about uh, why is that? What's the bottleneck? Well, I think brain is uh, the most complex organ in our body. And it's just so much easier to do with the heart or lung or other organs in the body than the brain. I mean, I've been doing brain work for 50 years. And I, I must say, I've done everything that anybody has done with both PET. Of course, SPECT is the other molecular imaging technique that we developed at Penn. That's what you know, we were doing before we started PET. And of course, you know, we have these days competing modalities. And big one is functional MRI. Honestly, having really learn a lot about the brain and realizing that no two people have the same brains. I may just, you know, think about uh, spatial aspect of life in my right side of the brain and somebody else may do it in another part of their brain. So not two of us is made similar. This has been the most frustrating aspect of my involvement with PET, SPECT, and of course, in the past you know, 30, 40 years, people have moved uh, to functional MRI. So it's just, uh, it's, you know, a very, very difficult area of research when it comes to really looking at psychology, and the center for anxiety, center for fears, and center for creativity. It, it just, every one of us is different from everybody else. I mean, I, I have to tell you, my inner talent is, is, is called spatial cognition. I, when I was in high school, I had books that were at times 800 pages. I used to read the entire book and remember where I read every word. So that it is called spatial cognition talent. I will go to a road, turn five times, 10 times around, I will repeat it when I come back because I remember that spatially. But there are a lot of people who are verbal. They just are mostly, they can just remember with their relating the words to where it was where they hear it. I was always jealous of people who had verbal abilities more than I did. I just didn't have that type of ability. So every one of us, this is one reason that I moved into imaging because I just, somebody, I will see a PET scan, you know, 10 days ago, and somebody will ask me, what did you see on that PET scan of a patient with lung cancer? The image will be in front of my eyes, exactly like I was seen on the screen. I would just describe exactly what I had on that image. And not very many people have that type of talent. So we all are different. And that really makes imaging for functions that are specific in the brain. As you just mentioned, this is psychology. So that is really why we will never be able to really solve the problem of what part of the brain does exactly what? I mean, yes, certain things like motor is very clear-cut. Sensation 
sensory cortex is very wide. Well. Visual cortex, these are the three areas that are very well defined. So you know if you have a stroke in the motor area, your right part, part of the body is not going to move. If you get rid of parts of your uh, occipital lobe where the vision is seen, you you know can easily see that on PET scan and MRI scan and know that the patient is going to suffer from what we call hemifield, you know, loss of vision. You cannot do that for pain. You cannot do that. Like pain is a big thing right now. Everybody wants to come up with solution to pain because there's so much addiction to opioids. We all want to learn where the pain center is in the brain. And we have difficulties identifying a site that pain is felt because it just looks different. You know, I've done work in acupuncture and seeing the effects of acupuncture on pain, but these are very superficial in data. So this is really the most frustrating part of really pain and psychology and other aspects of function of the brain that has really evaded us in contrast to cancer, in contrast to atherosclerosis, in contrast to musculoskeletal problems that are so clear cut. And, and I'm, I was actually, in a way, was forced to move away from brain. I started in brain 71 up until 1992. Then I said, well, let me just look at other diseases. And I don't regret it. You know, just solving the problem of infection, solving problems of cancer has been so much more clear cut than the brain alone. I mean, I've kept it on my interest in brain. I do a lot of work in brain still, but it's not very easy. I have to tell you also that functional MRI was sold as solution to understanding of the brain, the center for anxiety, center for love, center for all sorts of things. And I have to tell you, there are thousands of thousands of papers in the literature with functional MRI. They call it fMRI. And it's been under attack. A Swedish scientist about six years ago published a paper saying that 98% of what's fun what is described by fMRI is nonsense. And I don't blame him. I did it in that because... You know, I have colleagues at Penn who have really, you know, have seen them, you know, just talking to these normal subjects, trying to make them uh, upset and nervous and then see three dots on fMRI. They said, this is the center of anxiety. This is the center of fear. This is the center of upsetness. Honestly, it that's not going to be the solution. You know, if we just go to this Literature on fMRI, functional MRI, you see a lot of variant reports. Every scientist, especially these psychologists, have been able to get a lot of funds from fMRI. Just primarily, they have survived. They have paid their salaries. They have paid their technician salary. But they have not made a dent on it. Is definitely day-to-day -day practice of medicine based on this research. It's it's exciting to know how brain works. This is the most complex organ we have in our body. And it was nice to know how it works. But it's just not, unfortunately, that easy because of the complexity of the organ. It's just that we are so much different from each other. Every one of us use our brain differently than others. Just as I said, just I'm spatially oriented. A lot of people are verbally oriented. And it's just not going to be easy to really be able to convincingly show what brain does in this part, in frontal lobe, parietal lobes, occipital lobes, amygdala, basal ganglia, you know, all these places, medial temporal lobes. So, I mean, certain areas that we know when they have disease, we know what happens. Like you lose memory. That's in the temporal lobe. You know, you just with Alzheimer's patients, you know, you lose memory, and we see that on FTG scan, and and that is clearly the way to relate that. There, you know, temporal lobe is important for memory, but when it comes to more subtle things, when it comes to more specific questions, the literature is all over the place.
Thank you so much. My pleasure. Great. Uh, thank you, Shiva, and thank you, Abbas, for your great answer. Uh, let's go to Human. Welcome to the stage. We hear you. Thank you so much, uh, Mahmoud. Uh, I want to say hi to Professor Alavi and his time uh, for, for his time to answering our question. This is Human, Assistant Professor in the University of Montreal in Biomedical Engineering. My question is more about his vision about the future. Uh, we have had lots of progress in uh, imaging modalities like PET, CT, fMRI, but I would like to know his vision. What would be the next breakthrough in imaging modalities and what are the barriers that uh, now clinician like uh, Abbas has have uh, in, in their work? So the, uh, the engineers, uh, physicists can work on that in the future. Thank you so much. Well, I think the big thing is going to be quantification. I like to combine functional imaging of which three modalities are the big ones. Definitely PET is number one. And then MR probably stands next, at least in certain applications like the brain and then CT. So really the big challenges that we have is how to combine these imaging modalities for better quantification. And I've been very interested in the quantification because of really my interest in mathematics and geometry and physics. So I just want to, you know, nothing really new is going to come up. You know, the optical imaging is really interesting, but it's going to be very limited. It's primarily being applied these days to surgical you know, management. They, you know, they just use the optical probes and see metastasis spread of the disease and somebody lung cancer into the lymph nodes. So optical imaging is not going to be making a big deal. Although, you know, we initiated that there was a guy named Britton Chance at the University of Pennsylvania who was really one of the greatest scientists ever come to Penn. And he got very interested in optical imaging. I used to talk with him quite often. He was a good friend. And he yeah, that didn't go very far. Of course, this is really an area that really could be of interest. But other than that, I just don't know that there's going to be any new modality. But we have to see how best we can use the modalities that we have. That's where physicists, engineers, you know, people who are database-oriented, you know, scientists should focus on. For example, one of the big things that we have right now that will be of interest to you is LA partial volume correction. CT and MRI have a special resolution in the range of a millimeter or even better in certain parts, like in the brain, MRI can go probably to 400, 500 microns. So you can see that. CT is, you know, actually CT has got good resolution, but in small animals or small areas. And what definitely is substantially better than PET. PET's special resolution. This is something that I write a lot about. You will see it if you just go and put my name and quantification. Unfortunately, people don't understand the difficulties we have with PET. Special resolution of PET is pretty bad. You know, these positrons move before they find an electron and then, then they disappear. Positron and electron disappear into two gamma rays, 511 kV that they go in opposite direction, 180 degrees apart. And we detect those two gamma rays simultaneously, and that's why it's called coincidence detection of the two gamma rays. Positrons move at least one, two, three, four millimeters. So that automatically takes away from spatial resolution of PET. So we cannot come anywhere close to CT or MRI. And of course, we do imaging that it takes a while. We don't do images like CT. You tell the patient, don't breathe. And they just hold in their breath for about five seconds and you have done your CT. So 
we have to wait at least three or four minutes before we can make an image of any parts of the body. So this is a, means that the heart is moving, the lung is moving, the patient is moving. So you ended up with a spatial resolution of eight to 10 millimeters. So you're mixing a lot of apples and oranges. And this is something that I have been the leader in telling the world that we have to correct for this what's called partial volume effect. Partial volume effect is just deteriorating this size beyond what it is in the organ that you are imaging or phantom that you're imaging. So you must see the correct for partial volume. You must correct for uh, respiration. You must correct for cardiac cycle. So these are the issues that early scientists like you guys should really focus on. Quantification is going to be a big part of optimal use of PET. Like, you know, we want to see the degree of disease. If you don't create a partial, partial volume effect, you're only going to see 10, 20% of the things that you're trying to measure. So you're going to underestimate everything substantially. So partial volume collection brings things back to where they should be by whatever means you have outside the body. And of course, I have used CT, I've used MRI to do this because they represent the true in the size of the areas that we're looking at. Like in the brain, you have got gray matter, which is the part of the brain that has important neurons. You have got white matter. This is just the axons that are like wires that are taking information from brain to the periphery or from the periphery to the brain. And you have got water surrounding the brain, around the brain, also inside the brain. So you have got three different tissues that really all have different metabolism, different function, and you have to put these functions back to where they belong. This is really where partial volume correction becomes very important. So this is something, work. yes. Hello? Uh, I'm in Google. Sorry, the sorry. audience was microphone was on. Please go. Uh, are you hearing now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so did, did, did you get everything or did I, did I, did you miss my talk? Uh, no, no, no. There was just uh, one audience who just joined the stage. He forgot to um, mute his microphone. Yeah, please. Yeah, so this is something that really you can do to improve upon what comes out of the machine. So that city where people like you, PhDs and scientists who are interested in doing with imaging to improve the image quality and better quantification. The name of the game is going to be quantification in medicine. You cannot say mild, moderate, severe. This is what the typical radiologist do. Typical radiologist looks at the chest and says there's mild emphysema, moderate you know, cancer. They really don't give numbers, but that is going to change. Future of imaging is going to be decimal point precision. Precision medicine is the future of image. We just want to, you know, treat the patient with most toxic drugs, and we want to know whether there's an impact on disease or not. And you cannot do these by qualitative assessment. This is what typical radiologist does. Typical radiologist does three levels, mild, moderate, severe. This is the typical radiologist. The diseases looks mildly better than last time, which was moderate. This is unacceptable. You got to just say that disease, yeah, the patient had 3,000 units of disease and now has got 2,000 of units. That is such an important information. That just shows that what you're doing to the patient is doing something good. So that is, of course, one thing that I want to just mention. Also, I have been instrumental in introducing the concept of global disease assessment. Yes, it's important to look at regional information. Yes, a surgeon should know exactly where cancer is in the brain, where cancer is in the breast, 
to go there exactly. So that's only, of course, a fraction of a percent, maybe 1% or less, because 99% of times we don't do surgery on people. We don't do radiation therapy. So focal inflammation is important for, for certain applications, but we have come with this concept of global disease assessment. I want to look at the whole brain for somebody who has got mild cognitive impairments called MCI. This is just the beginning of Alzheimer's disease or maybe other demented illnesses. So we have developed this concept based on MRI and PET, global disease assessment. So global disease assessment is going to be fantastic for every organ and every disease. Like what I've developed, I can just tell you have got a patient with cancer that has got 10,000 units of uptake of the agent and you give a dose of chemotherapy and that becomes 8,000. That is so clear cut versus looking at the lesion that has got, we call it SUV, standardized, standardized uptake value of 10 and that that 10 becomes eight. That could be all due to just how you put your region of interest on that lesion. So we believe that partial volume correction as well as global disease assessment, which I have done more work in this area than anybody else, you know, over the past 30 years, especially I have just pushed this thing, you know, just correct for partial volume. And then especially in the past 15, 20 years, I've been pushing this global disease assessment in every disease from brain disorders to inflammation in the lung to COVID, you name it. And though we just are telling people that just look at whole body for inflammation in a patient with COVID rather than just looking at CT scan that there's a density in the right lower lobe, there's another focal disease in the left upper lobe. This is not going to go anywhere. You got to just tell clinician that this patient has 5,000 units of inflammation due to COVID and then either with some sort of intervention or just natural course of the disease, it becomes 2,000, you know that this patient is moving in the right direction. So these are my views about really what needs to be done with the current imaging modalities that very likely are going to be main instruments for years to come. I just don't think that there's going to be another invention like MRI, another invention like PET. It's just not going to happen. And I think this is just, we have to do more than what we're doing right now with the existing instruments and, and just make a better use of them. I think the, these modalities are misused and abused by a lot of people and I criticize them constantly because they just don't understand it or honestly, there are times that they're making up and just, you know, taking data that are not there. But if they really follow logic and they're honest, there's a lot that can be done. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate. Thank My you. Pleasure. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask one of the slider questions. Uh, actually, uh, He's on this stage, uh, so I'll go to him directly so he can ask his question. Uh, so welcome, Ali Akbar. Uh, stage is... Well, uh, thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, hi, everybody, and thanks for the time. Um, I would like, uh, first and foremost, appreciate Professor Alavi for sharing his exciting, amazing, and, uh, in, in my opinion, a very exciting background in life, research, and education. So... Um, thanks for being with us today, Professor. I'm uh, Ali Akbar Kamari. I'm a tenure track assistant professor at Aarhus University, and uh, I'm speaking here from Denmark. Um, uh, listening to your words, Professor, it's easy to hear and understand of your love of your uh, birthplace, hometown, and home country, or in general, uh, our dear Iran. So uh, similarly, it's for many of us here in this room who lives abroad, involved in a, a variety of researches and businesses that could be the same. Um, so I would like to hear uh, if you could uh, maybe share more about your collaborative research and activities with Iranian and, and 
Iranian uh, academic in Iran. For, for young researchers uh, like many of us here in this room, I would like if you could share more about of uh, maybe uh, how can we be more effective or really how can we help Iran uh, while we research and, and in many cases we have to do research and leave a route. For example, uh, one way uh, you may answer that question could be like if if uh, we go back maybe 30 years ago, what what would or what could you do in this regard? And uh, sorry if my question uh, may sound a bit too general. Thank you. It's Ali Akbar Danis. Thank you. Let me just tell you, you know, after the revolution, uh, my family actually came just before the revolution to uh, America and I did not go back to Iran. You know, just uh, I left Iran in '66, and uh, and, I, and I was, of course, visiting my family for a while, and then they came. So in 2000, I was visiting professor in Japan, and I met a an Iranian visiting scholar in uh, Kyoto, and. Uh, and I was invited to go to United Arab Emirates in 2001 to, in a meeting on molecular imaging, they invited me. The Arabs have been actually pretty nice to me, especially the Kuwaitis and United Arab Emirates and to some extent Egypt and even Saudi Arabia. So I, you know, I got an email from a student whom I have met in Japan, that Professor Alavi, you are flying over the country where you were born and giving talks to the Arabs and not to Persians who are your country men and women. I said, you're absolutely correct. So I said, just, just arrange a meeting, I'll come. So I started going to Iran and it, it was, you know, going well, it wasn't as, as much in depth until in the 2015 when the agreement was signed between Obama and the Iranian government. And then my friends and colleagues from University of Tabriz invited me to come to Tabriz. They want to celebrate my life. So I went there. This was just an amazing trip, you know, a city where I was brought up as an orphan with, it is, as I say, very primitive and humble means, goes back as a hero. The entire city celebrated my life, and my pictures with PET scans were hanging from electric poles all over the city. People will stop me and say, Professor Lav, it's nice to meet you. And I said, how do you know me? He says, look up, your pictures hanging from the pole. So I really became very much involved, I established a center in Tabriz called Alavi Aging Center, which still is ongoing. And fortunately, I was able to bring my colleagues from Odense, which is in southern Denmark, to Tabriz. A very good guy named Paul Fleming, whom still, you know, keep in contact, is a great friend, and he came along. So they established a very nice connection between University of Tabriz as well as Odense, University of Southern Denmark. In Odense, which, with whom I've been working actually for the past 10 years. So this has been very, very useful. You know, you know they actually donated a pet machine to Tabriz. Unfortunately, it has not been put up and running because of what's happened during the Trump era and difficulties that they have faced. So, that is what it was my it a big thing that I did for my hometown. But also Shait Veshti, we also connected them to both Copenhagen as well as Odense. And we tried to really do some uh, good work with them. Of course, they were interested in brain. So I've been able to help them as well. So unfortunately, with this situation with Trump, I have not been able to go to Iran. I just, 
don't want to go there and then come back and who did you talk to what did you do and and that really has been my major frustration that politics are influencing what we can do for 80 million people who are badly in need of a good health care you know from my angle I want to have every major university to have a pet machine. You know, I talked to Larry Johnny, who was the Minister of Health. He was very good. I mean, he's from Shiraz, University of Shiraz, and he really just was very, very aggressive about getting, the, you know, at least 15 pet machines to the country. But, you know, that just unfortunately, because of what was happening with the political aspects of Iran, so it's very frustrating that healthcare, human ill well-being, education could be the subject of so much destructive forces between governments that really, unfortunately, they are very selfish. They're just only looking from the angle and not looking at a patient who's suffering in any parts of the world. I mean, just these people could benefit from PET. We can stop 80% of surgeries that by doing PET scans, not to make the people suffer and not to spend a lot of money. I mean, this is a surgery like in my university hospital costs $200,000. And of course, like lung cancer patients already have metastasized and they just take them to the operating room based on CT that doesn't show that the disease has spread to the lymph nodes or other places. As you do, PET, realize that this patient should not go to surgery or should get radiation therapy. So this is the type of thing that is happening right now. By not having high-tech medicine in countries like Iran is just making people suffer enormously. And also the government or insurance companies or people personally pay a lot of money for these errors, for these lack of really good knowledge and good methodologies to really diagnose the disease, treat the patients better. So really, I want to this conflict in as soon as possible so they can go back. I want to go and see what's happening in Tehran, what's happening in Shiraz, what's happening in Tabriz. And I want to help these people. I want to just really just establish a better educational system. That was my aim, you know, that doing my really less active life in patient care, which I don't do anymore. I do only research in humans, but I don't take care of patients you know, on a daily basis, which is a lot of responsibility. So I spend most of my time in education, research, and of course, helping people around the world. It's not only people in Iran, it's not people in Denmark. I deal with a lot of people all over the you know, world. And so really, this is my hope that politics will not mix with science and definitely medicine, which is such a noble area of professional life that you are dealing with someone who's having pain, somebody who's suffering, and you do doing something to make a dent on that suffering however you can. So it's just very unfortunate that in, in spite of our willingness to help, we cannot. You know, that is just breaks my heart. You know, I just want to help my country. I want to help my people. And in every way we can. I mean, this is a duty. I mean, I felt guilty that I left Iran and came to America. You know, I just when the national anthem used to play song on radio, my hair will stand up. I was just there. I'm going to help my country. I'm going to help my people. You know, going to Tehran during the Shah's time and seeing the corruption and discrimination and not being connected to the higher ups in the system. I just say, I know nobody. I mean, I'm not going to be able to succeed in this country. And that led me to come to America, that I'll go to a country that at least they recognize people's talents and, you know, help them. So really, it's just the whole combination of things that have happened have really led to a horrible situation in Iran, not being able to even import drugs 
when they put the embargo in, in 2018, you know, Trump, they couldn't even get radioactive material to university of, you know, in various universities. And then we got involved and we tried to just tell people that this is it for humanitarian purpose. This has nothing to do with making bombs. So a lot of politics have been mixed with noble functions that are human rights, as I've said. Healthcare is human rights. And, and not being able to do that in my own part makes me feel very, very upset that we are not helping those you know, people. I and mean, I want to improve education in every level, definitely in medicine in Iran. Just establish some sort of patterns that we follow at places like Penn and establish them in all the major universities in Iran so the talents are really enhanced and people can really reach their potential. And unfortunately, that is really not happening and I don't know if there's any hope that things will change significantly, you know, in the coming years. Uh, thank you, Professor. My pleasure. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, as you said, I hope political games do not come on the way of healthcare and for people in need. And we hope uh, in future we see more pet centers back home and in any country in need, uh, as you said, they are uh, basic human rights uh, to have access to the healthcare. Um, I'm going to ask one of the slider question before moving to Ethan. Uh, so they ask about your student and scientists you train. Of course, during uh, many years of research, uh, not only you have made impact on people's life by your breakthrough research, but you also have trained many scientists. So they ask how many scientists you have trained, if you have any uh, estimate and any specific one you want to mention for his or her contribution in science. Thank you. Yeah, you know, one of my greatest pleasures of life is dealing with students. I don't, we don't have children. So my students are my children all over the world. And I've trained people from 70, 80, countries. They are members of my family, you know, honestly. When I go visit someone in Brazil, they take me to their home, introduce me to the newcomers, to their family. It's just such a great pleasure to have someone come to you and say, Dr. Lavi, I'm going to give one, two, three years of life, my life shape me, mold me the best I can be. What a trust. You know, it just, this is just amazing. This really just makes me emotional that I have hundreds of hundreds of students. You know, unfortunately, I don't have, <laughs> to haven't kept track of them. And they're from all over the world. And of course, my students are at Harvard, my students are at Hopkins, my students are at Penn, my students are, you know, Australia, India. To, the two highest scientists in India were my students, Rakesh Kumar and Sandeep Basu, who got the highest prize from the president of India. They were the most cited people in India. Amazing, truly. And it's just and these people, when I visit them, they do exactly that. They just take me to their homes and introduce me to their family, newcomers. So it's a privilege to really be a teacher. You know, you just don't take it lightly. You are changing the world by training people who are highly talented. They come to you and give their lives to your hand, trust you. It's just incredible. And and this just has happened in every continent in the in the world. And and I'm especially being honest with you, you can teach anybody to do surgery, open the abdomen and take off uh, colon cancer. You cannot do PET scan in Thailand, you know, without somebody training it and, and show how to do things. So as technical specialties like PET requires highly talented people who are interested in physics, mathematics, science, 
and and that is much much harder than training someone in surgery or internal medicine or orthopedics whatever so really that is really one of the greatest privileges of being a teacher that someone just gets benefit from your sincere effort to really just come down to their level, deal with them as your family members. I mean, this is just, I love my students wherever they are around the world. And, and it just, it, uh, it just been a, a major part of my academic life. I mean, academic life, you know, has, of course, as a physician, you have got patient care, and then you have got uh, research, but also teaching, just educating people for the future to make the world a better place. So really, that has been a just major pillar of my academic life that I have, of course, influenced the future of these people, but indirectly, I have changed also practice of medicine in their respective countries so that the patients in Thailand, in India, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Turkey are doing a better job for their patients than they did before coming and getting trained with someone like me. So these are just amazing aspects of academic life that is not just going to work and doing something that is a service and and a standard thing that and everybody else can do, you just then come home, you know. We are doing so many more different things than just standard workers in the society. We are just the elite, you know, especially, you know, major centers where there's a lot of research, high level education like Penn, like Harvard, like Hopkins, that we really are changing the world for a better place with everything we do. And, and then I will encourage every one of you, if the opportunity arises, to really choose life in academics. It's, you know, you have to be unselfish. You just have to put everything ahead of your own personal aspects or personal just pleasure, you know, and then take the into consideration the well-being of your students. When I just see these people come and spend, you know, year, two, three years of their lives with me. I cannot do anything but help them, you know, because I just say these people are just going to build a future based on what I'm going to provide them. So that's my uh, simple, long answer for your question. Thank you, Abbas. I appreciate it. Uh, It's interesting how you feel about your students. Uh, And it's not a surprise that PIs have a huge impact on the student's life. Uh, myself, I learned a lot from my Korean American PhD advisor, and every day uh, when dealing with people and um, uh, my team members, I remember his advice uh, in work, in life. Thank you. Um, let's move to uh, next audience. We have uh, two more people on the stage, and we are close to the two hour uh, limit we have for the room. So, Ethan, uh, welcome. Uh, please stay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here, and it's a great pleasure to meet all you guys. It's kind of a great pleasure for me that I wish that I had it earlier, but, well, happily, this time it's just time for me. Well, actually, I had a question which uh, dear Dr. Savoji asked, and I got some part of my answer, which doctor talked about, but there is just other thing. Well, everybody knows that interdisciplinary research is the key to success. Well, the one of, one of those interesting things that we are dealing with is applying machine learning, specifically machine, artificial intelligence, and deep learning. How uh, do you think, dear professor, about applying deep learning specifically in the medicine and specifically I want to say that more specifically in cognitive science, because I'm a junior researcher in this area, though I'm just a child neurologist, but I'm junior researcher in this area, and I would like really to have your idea about this area. Thank you, Sal. Well, uh, definitely a very pertinent question. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's a very pertinent question, and definitely... Artificial intelligence is going to play a major role in every discipline. 
in medicine, and particularly in imaging. There's no question that this is going to be revolutionary, and I then uh, just uh, taken science from a different angle that we have enough now foundation to really take it very far. You know, that city definitely in many areas of medicine, there'll be a lot of applications. So for sure in medical imaging, you know, honestly, not every person is the same as we have discussed during this two hours. Everybody has got different talents, different, you know, level of uh, understanding of their disciplines. So having artificial intelligence, just getting into act and give the first impression of what you're dealing with in every level, in particular in medical imaging. I think it's going to be very revolutionary because we all are different as we have discussed and, and we just don't have the same abilities, but standardizing it, you know, which really this artificial intelligence is going to provide is going to have an impact for first glance. So this is what's going to happen. You know, just like in somebody has got a CT scan of the chest, using these, you know, software and modalities that are being introduced by artificial intelligence is going to really guide the radiologist or any other specialist into focusing on things that are important. So that's definitely going to be impactful, you know, or, you know, putting all the information you have into your computer software and coming up with an answer based on, you know, these modalities is going to have a major impact on day-to-day practice of medicine. Whatever you do, whether it's cognitive information, whether it's imaging, whether it's, uh, you know, pulmonary specialist. So everybody is going to benefit from this type of approach. You know, this is really where science should make an impact. But still, you need good human being to put all these things together and make sense out of that. You cannot let the machines and software dictate how to deal with serious diseases of mankind and then follow what the machine tells you. This is not going to happen. No two people are the same, as I've said all along. Our brains are different. Our diseases are different. So this is where you're going to need doctors. You need doctors that puts all that information together based on really logic and common sense and then manages the patient for serious diseases that we deal with. So they are good, but they are not solution to problems of the world. It's just going to be you know, just all combined and better use the same way that, you know, when we used to you know, practice in Tehran when I was a medical student, we had, you know, just such primitive tools that really just made it very difficult to really diagnose disease. And then I got introduced to conventional x-ray, then I came to America, and, you know, we had all this laboratory tests, we have all this MRI, CTs, PET, still final arbitrator is a good doctor who can put all these things together and make the best sense of what is going on. So that's my long answer to your question because just, you know, honestly, these scientists, PhDs are trying to make a room for themselves. Medicine is very lucrative. Everybody wants to have a place for it. So Everybody's doing something and they want to get ahead of everybody else. But when it comes especially for patients, physicians are the kings. They have to really understand these technologies and make a use and appropriate applications of these technologies. You just cannot let machines dictate to you what you're going to do. And and that just that's how you know, that's why being knowledgeable about these tools is essential. We got it. That's why we have to have multifaceted training in medicine. Medicine is no longer memorizing as it was during my medical school years 65 years ago. So 
we have to really get people who have interest in um, physics, chemistry, mathematics, computer sciences. You know, all these things have to be part of education and medicine so that we are not misled by uh, really uh, just only one modality and make wrong decisions. Truly appreciate it, dear doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Ethan. Um, so we have Jocelyn. Um, hi, Jocelyn. Thank you. Um, welcome to our room. We hear your Yes, thank you very much. And hi, Doc. And thank you for your wisdom. Um, yeah, I was intrigued by a story that was in the news. Well, it's been in the news since 2017 about the, um, the American and Canadian diplomats who ended up with um, what's called an immaculate concussion after being exposed to some type of energy weapon. Um, I heard you discuss earlier um, that you're not a fan of functional MRIs, but I think that's what was used to diagnose their, uh, the fact that they have decreased white matter. Um, so I really think it would be naive to think that this sort of thing is just happening to diplomats. I'm just wondering what's being done to educate doctors uh, on this um, new type of way of injuring the brain, this external attack, and other than a functional MRI, how can you diagnose that this is something external as opposed to an intrinsic medical condition? Thank you. Well, you know, MRI, as I've you know, discussed with you, uh, and as well as, of course, CT, as structural imaging techniques, they cannot tell you what's happening functionally. I personally don't know how much contribution MRI is going to make to functional aspects of the brain. You know, we have been um, in the use of some techniques at Penn, magnetizing the blood in the carotid arteries and looking at perfusion in the brain, which really, you know, we have had grants and we have tested compared to PET. It doesn't work well. So then what's left is really going to be, you know, fMRI. And I have personally some concerns about overuse and over interpretation of function. So the only option you have in a patient with head injury, and I've got a ton of them. I've done a lot of research in head injury. is going to be FDG PET. If you want to find out what's happened to the, to the brain after head injury, you got to use FDG of course, PET CT, and you can do MRI and you know, or PET MRI, and compare what you see on FDG versus structural imaging. You'll be surprised to see significant disparity between what you see on the structural imaging and what you see on PET. So, PET is going to show you what's happening in the gray matter everywhere, in the cortex, in the basal ganglia, in the thalamus, and in the cerebellum. And, and we have actually written a fair amount on pet, pet and head injury. We had one of the largest pet injury research in the world at Penn at one time, especially in the 80s. So that's what I did a lot of work with head injury. And so you have to use the right modality to see the extent of the injury. And it's just going to show you, you know, the, where the... Uh, a functional abnormality. So many of them are going to be without any change on the structure. You're just going to see things that are clearly abnormal on PET, in the gray matter, in the parietal lobes, frontal lobes, occipital lobes that you cannot see on CT or MRI scans. So that's it in my view overall, as I expressed earlier. And, and it's just, it's no different for head injury. It's just, you know, that's, you know, we are very, very interested in this area and uh, because, you know, every year 50,000 people die from uh, car accidents and head injury and uh, another million people are impaired because of concussion and uh, more serious diseases. So it's a major healthcare problem around the world with cars that are fantastic. Without them, you cannot live in modern society, but it's the biggest weapon.
in every society. This car accidents are horrible, and of course, when the workers get injured and by head injury and the construction workers and others, of course, a big problem is actually people in Afghanistan that have a lot of head injury, and the army has had you know request for a proposal from for people who were coming from Afghanistan. These are, and of course the same thing happened in Iraq. There were a lot of uh, dynamites that were causing head injury. So it's a, it's a major healthcare problem and uh, it's just huge impact on the society. Like a million people having head injury that affects them in many ways. And I think that is going to be the way to go. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot you can do. I mean, you just have to, follow the course of the disease, see how much function is coming back after uh, the initial injury. You know, quantifying them is very important, as I discussed earlier, looking at whole brain metabolism after or function after these injuries will be the way to go. So thank you, Doc. I know quite a few patients came there um, with the Havana syndrome. I would appreciate if you could just speak a little bit more on that especially, you know, there are many doctors in the room and um, just to highlight the fact that this is a new phenomenon. I mean, what is new phenomenon? What is it? Havana syndrome. As, what's, as on, what, spell it? Havana, the capital of Cuba, where the, the attacks first started and uh, they are more widespread now. People, government workers have been injured in Washington in Vienna, over um, 130 people were injured, um, spread out across the globe. You know, I don't have an updated information on that. You can send me an email. I, I could, will. Uh, you can easily find my email address. Thank you, Doc. I'll be happy to just send you more details. Great. Uh, Thank you, uh, Jocelyn, uh, for joining us. And as was mentioned, please uh, get in touch with him. I'm sure he, he will be able to help. So as uh, the last person on the stage, Mahsa, welcome. Uh, stage. Uh, thank you so much, Mahmoud. Um, hi, Dr. Alavi. You mentioned Britain Chance, and that's why I came to stage uh, to tell you that I did my PhD with uh, Britain Chance. Uh, he was my co-advisor, and he always talked about you very fondly. Uh, everything that I learned about optical imaging and mitochondrial redox is from Brit. And you are one of the pioneers like him who has impacted the field tremendously. And I want to commend you for that and also for the fact that uh, you disseminate the knowledge, you share the knowledge without any hesitation. So I just wanted to uh, thank you for that and uh, also a tribute to Brit uh, that was mentioned today. I uh, truly miss him. Let me tell you, Brit was my academic father. I loved him. He really, yeah. he was a, an incredible human being. And being honest with you, he was totally against pet. When we yes, he was. Him, but... <laughs> yes, but he was. I converted him to accepting Pat. So Ili, he was a genius and having someone like him talk fondly about me is a great honor. No, I just you yeah. know, I used to have yeah, I used to have lunch with him every week. I used to go to his office and sit there and talk about different things, signs otherwise in life. So Ellie, you know, Brit was just a fantastic person, and uh, and I'm glad that you had you got to know him. And, yes, uh, I was lucky, uh, you know, to be able to um, basically work under him. And I remember him taking his bike, uh, you know, on campus and to your place, you know, going basement to the radiology. So he was, you know, he was really active and. Uh, a role model. I really hope that, you know, when I reach that age, I'm still as enthusiastic as uh, Brit was because he was always wanting to learn new things. And I think, you know, uh, you remind me of him. <laughs> You're very much like him. Well, I think that's fantastic because he really was my role model. I really, 
you know, we had a lot in common. And, and he just taught me way of life as it relates to science and his personality. And, and again, you know, someone like me comes from nowhere. You know, people thought that we are a bunch of really, you know, I don't know what to say, but a lot of people didn't see someone like me has to offer to American society. But Britt was such an incredible person. He saw in me something that was listening to and dealing with. And that really impressed me so much about him, as I said. And I just loved him as a father. I mean, just like, and, you know, he, he said to me, I respect you more than anybody else on the face of the earth. And I said, Britt, coming from you, means so much to me. Someone in your stature, you know, who have been nominated three times for a Nobel Prize. Yes, exactly. Say that, yeah, say something nice about me. What could be, that's the ultimate, you know, for me in my life to really just work hard and get somebody like him recognize that I'm not really in an insect, you know, I really can contribute to this world. And he saw that in me, that what that down with pet and helping so many people around the world was worthy of any recognition and, and dealt with me with enormous respect. And I just, thanks for mentioning it. I mean, this, I didn't know that he really even talked about me in the last. Yes, he did. He was very fond of you. And I just wanted to thank you for everything that you have done for the science. And we are very proud. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh. Thank you, Maslow, for joining us. Um, um, so we started this room at noon Eastern time with uh, Professor Alavi, who is one of the pioneers in nuclear medicine. And thank you for your time uh, answering our questions. As a last question, because someone couldn't uh, ask in the Slido, they just back channel. Uh, so they, uh, I mean, the question is about medical optical imaging and what areas uh, this uh, method has or has uh, uh, like opportunity to advance. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, Bruce uh, actually was a pioneer in optical imaging because of really not being able to penetrate, you know, through the thick tissues. External imaging is not, you know, Britain used to work with me on uh, looking at brain in patients with Alzheimer's disease, but it did, it wasn't that easy to really penetrate the skull and go deep down. So nowadays, as I said, they are using it primarily in the surgical you know, fields and especially looking for a you know, cancer metastasis to lymph nodes or extension of the disease. It's definitely a very powerful technology and uh, and it still is evolving and we just have to see how far it's going to go. It's not going to be anywhere close to what PET can do, uh, but you know, every piece of science is going to have some application in medicine and not everything is going to be CT, MRI, and PET. You know, this is just, uh, I mean, I have to tell you, we, of course, invented SPECT, which is that's a tomography technique that we inter introduced in uh, Penn in the 60s. You know, we had a function in a tomographic unit with the SPECT. SPECT is the type of isotope that we use in, in a conventional nuclear medicine. These are single gamma emitters, not positron emitters. And, and of course, we, I personally think that is going to go. I mean, it's just not going to compete with PET. So really, not everything we do is going to stay around. So you cannot label single gamma emitters like technetium, like iodine to every molecule as we can with carbon-11, fluorine-18, and many other positron-emitting elements. So... You know, certain things are going to go all the way. Certain things are not going to go all the way. And and that's how life is. And I just, uh, you know, we have come from uh, riding camels and horses and donkeys to flying with ultra fast, you know, planes. Uh, so, you know, nobody's using those tools. And in my hometown, we had only 20 cars when I was growing up. And I do remember the night. 
the license plate of every car because there were so few. If you got a ride in one car for 10 minutes, you will celebrate for the entire year. But now there are thousands of cars in Tabriz. So, you know, things just change and high tech is a very, very evolving thing. And that's applicable to medical imaging. That, that not one single approach is going to be the only approach. You know, we just have to accept and understand and be honest about what we can do with each modality and we're dealing with human life, we're dealing with suffering, we're dealing with pain. We cannot mislead the community. Unfortunately, people fabricate their data to make it look good so they can get grants. You know, that's not fair to humanity and uh, we just have to be honest. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your answer. Uh, that was our last question, and I want to appreciate all you have done for science and making people's life better and the impact you have had on uh, everyone's life around the world. Uh, as a closing remark, we would like to hear your words, your thoughts, any advice you have for uh, people listening to you. Well, it's been a real pleasure and honor to really share my humble thoughts with you and you know above all i want you to just never give up all right uh might be his cell phone uh that lost um uh, power or battery issue let me uh send him the room link and hopefully he might be able to join otherwise we just uh, wrap up all right thank you for uh staying with us uh we usually have these rooms in persian and uh unless the there is like request by the guests um professor alavi has been here for many years several uh uh, decades and uh, it was easier for him to of course speak in English and we respect that his uh, decision uh, if you click on the green uh, icon on the top Harvard Iranian Club you can follow the club and also check our future events uh, next week we are going to have a room with Professor Elham Kashafi uh, she is also a pioneer in the field of quantum computing and uh, also uh, Professor Bijan Najafi. Uh, he's a professor of surgery at Baylor College of Medicine. And in September 19, we have a Q&A session with Professor Samina Shahim. She is a, a graduate dean in Halt International Business School in London. And once we have more guests, we will schedule and you can see on the club. If you follow the club, you will get notification uh, as we schedule, as we schedule them. All right, uh, we can wait for uh, 30 seconds. If uh, he's not able to come back, then we can uh, wrap up the room. Sorry for this issue. Uh, it happens if you keep the phone <laughs> on for over two hours. Uh, it's normal that you may, uh, you may, the battery may uh, just get drained. All right. Um, any um, closing remarks, Samana, Mohammed, Esan, you guys have? Well, I just wanted to thank you all for being with us today and for supporting us. Uh, I really have, have enjoyed today's discussion uh, and for, for all his support on educational and research opportunities for a student in nuclear medicine. And hopefully uh, we will see you in our future rooms. Stay tuned and have a good day or night. It was very informative and very powerful session. Uh, thanks for your participation. And also I want to thanks uh, for uh, Dr. Alavi for being with us. Um, have a good one. All right, Esa, are you here? All right, um, so 
we will appreciate uh, and thank you him after this room um, so we will play a music for a few seconds and I seconds. apologize uh, I had a problem with the mic uh, so oh go ahead no 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 like no, just go ahead like there's nothing to say I'm totally fine okay and uh, so we could play the music for 30 seconds in case if you want to follow the club and check the future events and thank you so much for your time anywhere you are in the world have a good day and night